Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. Hello, this is John Bicknell. Before we get into today's discussion, I just want to give a short introduction which will help frame what you are about to hear. So in this discussion, we have three gentlemen who were uh, integrally involved in the development of the new joint doctrine, JP3-04. And so you will hear them discuss the history, explaining the process and the challenges the team faced during development of the joint concept and supporting joint doctrine. They will also discuss the big ideas of the JCOIE, for example, informational power, design, the joint function, the information force, and how those flowed through the capabilities-based assessment and .mlpf-p solutions to the J. Rockham and were placed into joint doctrine. This provides the context for the subsequent discussion of that joint doctrine from JP1 through JP3-0 and into the entirely new publication, as I mentioned before, jp JP3-04, Information in Joint Operations. Finally, we'll discuss the other J. Rockham items and challenges to normalizing information in joint operations. And now on to the discussion. We have three guests today on the Cognitive Crucible, Mr. Eric Wallace, Derek Elliott and Ron Walters. And each of these gentlemen were part of the Joint Information Operations Warfare Center, or the JIOIC, until recently. And each of them played a key role in some of the recently published joint doctrine about the information environment. And so we are going to unpack that today. So Eric Wallace, Derek Elliott, and Ron Walters, welcome to all of you to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. Thank you for having us. All right. So we're going to be talking about uh, the Joint Pub 3-04, which recently came out, as well as the Joint Concept for Operating in, information, in the Information Environment from the 2018 timeframe. Uh, could one of you please help unpack the history of this effort that has uh, seemed to have moved the Joint Force and the services to relook at how they use and leverage information? Sure, John. This is uh, this is Eric Wallace, and, and again, thank you for hosting the Cognitive Crucible. It's a great podcast, and and for the Information Professionals Association for the work they've been doing in support of information and cognitive security. As part of our discussion, one of the things I just wanted to mention is is that throughout our processes of going through the joint concept for operating the information environment, uh, the OIE capability based assessment. As and the and the Jiraka memo, as well as the the joint publication, we really wanted to to thank all the people that were out there who helped us through the through this process. Um, so that included um, all of the services, um, OSD policy, the principal staff advisor for information operations, the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, uh, the joint staff. Not only the J5, the J7, the J3 and J39, um, as well as the J2, and then and then really um, the combat commands, but specifically U.S. SOCOM, um, as well as U.S. Cybercom, uh, that the expertise that they provided, and then on top of that, um, the Rand Corporation. Uh, that was part of our capability-based assessment and, and the joint concept development. And then the Institute for Defense Analysis that was brought on as part of the capability-based assessment 
and, and really this the sled dogs I would say was uh, was the the contracting team for the capability based assessment um, that was out of Booz Allen Hamilton and then Ameritech services that was uh, part of our team uh, in the Javik. So just wanted to say thank you for that. We couldn't have done any of that without them. We started this journey back in late 2014 and, uh, and then started in earnest in 2015. Uh, one, one of the problems that we've had with um, information operations over the last 20 plus years is it always seems like it's a, it's a one-off or in a cottage industry, so to speak. And so one of the things that um, actually an IPA member, uh, Mr. Austin Branch said, um, as he was the principal staff advisor for information operations in uh, Office of Secretary, Under, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, was that, that, that this community really needed to normalize the business of information operations. And so in the JIWIC, as a, at the time, it was the Enterprise Operations Division, and now uh, it was the Information Proponent Division, uh, later changed to it, that, uh, that, I, that I ended up taking over. Uh, we really took that to heart from the standpoint of what is it that we have to do to normalize this business? And, and Ron, was, Ron Walters uh, was one of the first teammates to really begin that process. And so that started with us doing a prospectus within the joint staff J7 process of joint concepts. And that's where the capstone concept for joint operations goes, as well as now there's, there's four concepts within the department that, uh, that they've been working on for, for some time as they move forward and look at how future joint operations um, will unveil itself. So as we went through that, we developed the joint concept for operating in the information environment, which, which included working with the services, the, the normal information operations professionals that uh, were across, across the services and combat commands, as well as the J5 communities and the future concepts communities within the services to really start to normalize the idea of how are we gonna look at information? And, and, and Ron, Mr. Walter was one of the guys that, that was really looking deep into this problem about what, what is happening and what do we need to do differently to, to, to normalize this business. And so we really took a blank slate from that standpoint and wrote the concept where we had to think about information and, and integrating it into operations during all things. And then the idea really became of the idea of integrating informational and physical power in conducting uh, conducting operations. That took us to uh, the concept, which had 17 concept required capabilities, which you can Google that and find it online. Um, and then that led us to a capabilities-based assessment or CBA, um, which eventually um, was the output of that came to a joint requirements oversight council memorandum, which gave the, the services, OSD policy and others within the um, OS Office of Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff Combat Commands, um, 52 or 51 actions that they need to take in order to normalize, operationalize, and institutionalize information as it became a joint function to conduct operations in the information environment, which then borne out in joint publication 3-04, which is information and joint operations. Okay, wow, that, uh, that was a lot, Eric, and uh, thanks for that. And by the way, we'll have a link in the show notes to that uh, joint concept document that Eric mentioned just a moment ago. Um, I think, gentlemen, it might be helpful for some in our audience uh, just to take a short little step back and just give a quick little 101 on you know, what is joint doctrine, what's the purpose, et cetera. Oh, this is Derek. Um... Uh, and I'll take that question. Uh, I assume that most of the audience understands that joint operations are those operations connected by two or more of the US services. Uh, joint doctrine publications govern activities and performance of the US armed services in those operations. Uh, they, they are essentially our, the way we communicate between the services to conduct operations uh, where the services might have their own doctrine so it's more of a uh, Rosetta Stone, if you will. 
Um, the doctrine, the joint doctrine provides military guidance for exercise of authority by combatant commanders who are joint commanders and other joint force commanders and just prescribes joint doctrine for operations and training. So commanders use their own judgments in applying the doctrine to get their missions done. I see. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Would you say that the joint doctrine also extends into uh, uh, global partnerships as well? Is there a touch point with our with our allies too? It, it certainly does. Um, so it provides considerations for our interaction with governmental and non-government agencies and those multinational forces that you're referring to, and even other interorganizational partners uh, when we're we're operating in a in an environment where we have to work with them. Great. And so I, I guess kind of an extension of the previous question. So who, who is the primary audience then for joint doctrine for, you know, JP 304 and the joint concept for operating in the information environment? Well, all, all joint doctrine applies to joint staff, the commanders and combatant commanders, um, subordinate unified commands, joint task forces, any subordinate components of those commands so that we can operate with unity of effort. Um, and that includes, say, the National Guard Bureau, combat support agencies. Uh, secondary audiences would certainly be those uh, allied and other partners who are working with us so that we can work seamlessly. All right. Well, so thanks for that intro. Uh, so maybe we can start stepping into some of the details just a little bit more. So what, what exactly is a joint function? And this is for those in our audience who may not understand the purpose of a joint function or the difference between a war fighting or joint functions and operations. So this is Derek. Uh, I can take that. Um, so a joint function is a grouping of tasks along with the systems that perform those tasks, the systems being the combination of organizations, people, the tools they use. Um, so those tasks and those systems working together provide the critical capability to help joint force commanders synchronize, integrate, and direct joint force operations. That's a mouthful. Simply put, each joint function describes an ability that a commander must have in order to conduct an operation. Uh, for instance, uh, the aptly named command and control joint function describes the critical capability of command and control. Uh, the fire joint function describes the capability to provide effective fires and so forth and so on with the other functions. Uh, there are seven joint functions. Um, they are uh, command and control, information, intelligence, fires, movement and maneuver, protection and sustainment. And if you wanna read more about them, you can go to JP30. Uh, which is uh, the publication above JP304 in the hierarchy of pubs. Okay, great, guys. So could one of you unpack a little bit more as far as, you know, what is new within Joint Pub 3-04? And to our audience, uh, Eric, Ron, and Derek were kind enough to provide a nifty recap slide and uh, that slide is available in the show notes and you might want to pull that slide up as they are talking through some of these changes. So can one of you uh, uh, take a crack at this please? Well certainly. Uh, so JP304 is the doctrine that explains and supports the information joint function. Uh, prior to 304, the information joint function was placed into JP30 and didn't have foundational joint level doctrine. 304 was meant to, to fill that gap. Uh, JP304 provides fundamental principles and guidance to plan, coordinate, execute, and assess the use of information during all joint operations. Uh, it's broken down into different sections. It introduces the fundamentals of information in the context of the security environment. Uh, it describes the joint forces use and leveraging of information through the information joint function during all operations because it does apply to all operations. It certainly discusses the DOD's role in maintaining unity of effort in and through the information environment. And it describes how the joint force operationalizes the information joint function through operational design in planning of operations that use information and deliberately leverage the inherent information aspects of activities and by conducting operations in the information environment. One of the critical things that JP304 does is 
codify relevant terms in their definitions and descriptions than places them in a logical construct. This was critical because it addressed the confusion borne by the existence of a plethora of terms in use across the joint and combined forces. Some of them were confusingly defined, some were undefined, many were colloquial defined, and some had multiple definitions that were at odds across the services. Uh, the joint writing team realized that we needed a common terminology in order to explain how the joint force uses information during operations. So we went about defining, redefining, or providing clarified descriptions of existing terms and introducing a couple of new terms. For example, uh, the most significant example is the updated description of the information environment, or the IE. JP304 clarifies what the IE is and what it contains, and most importantly, that the IE is a component of the Joint Force Commander's operational environment, not a separate battle space. The publication also defines informational power, inherent informational aspects of activities, operations in the information environment, also referred to as OIE, um, and those are military actions involving the integrated employment of multiple information forces to affect drivers of behavior by informing audiences, influence foreign and unknown actors, attacking and exploiting relevant actor information, information networks, and information systems, as well as protecting friendly information networks and systems. So all of these things need to be done ahead of uh, creating that, creating the document, and they needed to be put in that logical construct so that you could see the, the relationships between these terms because none of them can exist in a vacuum. And we think that helps the joint force move forward in being able to not only do these things, but communicate amongst themselves. At this point, uh, listeners might want to refer to the chart you referenced so we can go over some of those terms in context. Uh, a little background, we had a challenge with this doctrine because all the services were moving out uh, in slightly different directions in trying to get information into the design of operations, uh, moving beyond information operations. So uh, if you look at that chart, that is a, a logical description of terms and um, some, some definitions and how they relate to one another in context, because we found that was very important. Uh, so going over to the chart, we talk about um, how the US as a nation conducts information warfare. That's a non-doctrinal uh, term. Uh, we do discuss it in JP304, but it is not a doctrinal term. Um, we just talk about it as a strategic approach of mobilizing information to attain a competitive advantage and achieve US policy goals. And it encompasses a broad range of offensive and defensive efforts that use information to exploit the information environment against adversaries, influence foreign audiences and compel decision makers to take certain actions. Very broad. Within that realm of information warfare, we have uh, what the joint force does. Uh, we apply informational power through our campaigns to gain and maintain information advantage in support of national objectives. And how does the joint force apply informational power? Um, we do that by concurrently leveraging information aspects of activities and conducting operations in the information environment. With regard to leveraging information aspects, that's something conducted by all joint force organizations to uh, during all operations activities and investments and making information a primary consideration to the planning, execution and assessment of all joint force activities. That gets into the design, thinking about exactly what you want to happen, uh, the effects you want to have on the environment when you're conducting operations. And part of having those effects is understanding what are we trying to do with our operations that have an effect on information that people, people perceive. Um, so that's leveraging information aspects of activities. As far as conducting operations in the information environment, the second part of those concurrent activities, we speak in terms of objectives, military objectives being uh, an enemy force, um, the destruction of that enemy force, for instance, or a piece of terrain. Uh, but we really ought to be looking at what exactly do we want people to do? And how do we do that? By getting them to perceive things uh, through the use of information or leveraging those activities to inform, to uh, persuade, 
and otherwise influence them to do those things we need done that might go beyond an immediate military objective. And operations information environment, we'll refer to them as OIE here. Those are military actions involving the integrated employment of multiple information forces, a act an actual force, to affect drivers of behavior by informing audiences, influencing foreign or relevant actors, and attacking and exploiting relevant actor information, information networks, and information systems. Uh, as such, OIE are distinct from, but complementary to the Joint Forces deliberate leveraging of inherent informational aspects of military activities during all operations. Essentially, OIE are specialized forces that will be able to do things to either support or in some cases lead activities to influence human behavior. And we envision as part of this, having those forces as, as supporting joint force commands operations. We felt it was very important to talk about information forces as uh, an integral part of OIE. Uh, information forces are the building blocks of OIE units and those are active and component and reserve component forces specially organized, trained and equipped to create and or support the creation of effects on the IE. The information forces aggregate military personnel, weapon systems, equipment, and the necessary support that provides expertise and specialized capabilities, for instance, civil military operations, military information support operations, public affairs, electromagnetic support operations, and cyber operations. And these things leverage information and conduct activities central to OIE. We talk about information forces, the types of information forces in the document, but do stress that these are a distinct type of force populating a distinct organization, the OIE units. Got it. Um, what has happened to the term information operations itself? The, at the joint level, the term joint information operations is, is going away or has gone away with a publication of JP304. That doesn't mean that uh, services can't use those terms. Uh, we have a section in JP304 that discusses what's happening. And essentially we're transitioning from information operations to operations in the information environment. Information operations was essentially a staff function, which named or not will still be required to be done at a staff level. Um, that was the employment of IR IRCs in support, excuse me, information related capabilities in support of broader joint force operations. Um, but that often overlooked planning for the inherent informational aspects of activities where OIE is more broad and actually gets into the development side of planning operations. I see. What are the challenges that you guys perceive associated with assessing the joint forces use and leveraging of information in joint operations? The whole uh, approval of information to be a joint function was, was really something that hadn't been done, I think, in over, over 20 years of adding a new function uh, for the joint community. Mm -hmm. Another piece of that was that um, usually the joint community follows service leads, right? So a lot of the, the functions that you see as joint functions today came mainly out of the army as their warfighting functions. And so when information was approved at the joint level, which was approved by the then chairman, uh, General Dunford, uh, endorsed by Secretary of Defense Mattis, this was the first time that we had seen the joint community ahead of the service. And so what that is really causing is the services now to, to, to understand that joint function and then to sort of catch up. And so you're starting to see that. And I think Derek mentioned that uh, uh, services taking their own approaches within the greater joint construct. So right back to uh, um, assessing the use and leveraging information. Um, I think the first thing is, is, is that the services, and we spoke of the service formations, the MIG, the IATF, 60th Air Force, Navy Information Warfare. I think the most important thing is, is 
is they start to get some reps under them and reps is part, you know, is, is, uh, as they work with, um, their service elements, meaning that they have to be incorporated into the deployments, the exercises and training, uh, so that not only they can get comfortable with what they're doing, but their individual services get comfortable with, with the roles that they play. Um, I think what's going to what's gonna come out of this is there's going to be a discussion about organizing at Echelon. Um, in other words, um, what does that, you know, what is a formation at the joint level? Where does, where does that formation or unit operate at the service or component level? Where does that, you know, what do, what do those units look like? Um, you know, at, at lower levels, uh, division, brigade, et cetera. And that organizing discussion is going to require that we look at information control measures, um, which is going to help us manage the information battlefield, if you will, um, so that there's certain spaces that we might want to retain at, 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 uh, at that combatant command or component level. And then, you know, as you go down into the formations, figuring out what that space looks like. Um, information doesn't stay in a nice little neat box. Um, and, and it might help us to look at, um, uh, you know, fire control coordination measures and the roles that they play and think about that in terms as we think about information. I think those are going to come in time. Then I think the last piece um, is really refining um, this this uh, information and intel support to information relationship. Um, we, we've had conversations about this, and and we would say that that sixty percent of that ownership goes to the information community. We have to do a better job at at, at laying out for the intel community what space we're going to be in, uh, what effects we're trying to get, when we're going to do that and do it in enough detail and have an appropriate conversation with the Intel community so that they can, they can understand that uh, they can help, help us frame a baseline and then they can position themselves um, to, uh, to see the effects um, uh, or lack thereof, if you will, uh, of information activities. And I think in time, um, those things will help us get getting to uh, have a better feel for the assessment of um, operations in the information environment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, do you guys have a sense of what the reception has been within, let's say, the primary audience uh, for, for this pub? And adding to that, what do you feel is the potential impact of this new joint pub? So, uh, so I'll touch the, uh, the, the very beginning as, as far as um, how it's been received. And then I'm gonna hand it over to, to Ron Walters to talk, um, to talk further. Great, thanks. So, so as we've done the, the joint concept, that was the beauty of, of actually doing the joint concept because those are normalized DOD processes that when joint concepts are developed, they get handed over to the services. And now the services get to look at those, um, uh, experiment with them, and then they build, they start building their own uh, institutional look at, at, at that particular concept. And so we're seeing that today across the different services. You see the Marine Corps, which we feel was leading the way as uh, they have actually adopted information as a warfighting function within within their doctrine. And they, they've led, they actually led uh, MCDP-8 information, right? As, uh, as, as the first doctrine that came out uh, from the services, which we were working hand in glove with them as, as we moved forward, which was really the beauty of, of as we've moved forward was it that we did do a very collaborative uh, effort in making sure we included all the communities as part of the, the this, this publication. Ron? Yeah, so to, to carry off on that, um, sort of like to point out that, you know, as we went through 
uh, writing the joint concept for operating the information environment, and then on through the CBA, and then um, uh, into the doctrine itself. For for lack of better words, it wasn't a lockstep process, and so the community that was involved in writing the concept, all the services, you know, the, uh, from uh, the different elements out of uh, DOD and the joint staff and academia, as we start working our way through these these um, ideas that we were building out know, of the concept, you know, they would go back and not only mull through them to contribute to the concept, but then also start to think about how does it impact our services. Um, and then like uh, Eric alluded to, the joint function came out, which then started to get the services to, to really start to go, hey, this is something that's moving that we're gonna have to, 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 uh, to incorporate in how we do business. Um, and so what we saw is the services were moving at a, at a pace that once these, these elements start to hit, you know, the, the concept and the Jerocum, they were already starting to move in that direction. And so to, if I'm getting to your original question is, is they sort of create this bow wave so that when the joint pub hits, they're already starting to move in that direction. And so what we're seeing is like uh, uh, Eric mentioned, uh, the Marine Corps adopting uh, information as a war fighting function from a service level, um, leading the way with the development of uh, MCDP-8 on information. Um, having a, you know, uh, having a three-star as the, the director, um, dire uh, deputy commandant for information for the Marine Corps. We see the Army working with developing the Information Advantage Task Force and the Air Force going through their process and uh, through the 16th Air Force and working through IW, the, the relationships for, between what they call information warfare and information operations. And then of course the activities with the Navy at the different, uh, the NIOAs. We started to see some movement just because of the community that was engaged in the development of the concept um, and of the Jiraka. Um, they were also responsible for leading the way within their own service services uh, in the development of how they were going to uh, respond to uh, what was what was laid out in the joint concept and uh, within the Jerocum itself. Information was all, you know, often the afterthought. It was plans were developed and then it was often, hey, how do we how do we incorporate information to support our plans? And, you know, we really sort of captured that in the concept by saying, how does the joint force build information, you know, into operational art to design operations that deliberately leverage informational aspects of military activities? Um, and we we laid out like basically three supporting ideas, if you were, which is the joint force has to understand information and it's not from a sender perspective, but from a receiver perspective. And it's the receiver that then takes in that information, organizes it, and you know, and and, and contextualizes it through its world's view. Um, we then have to understand how we institutionalize um, that integration of the integration of physical and informational power, um, which is we have to understand how we build it into our strategy and doctrine, how we organize, how we develop a lexicon. Let me just um, uh, mention to our audience here, Ron. So j b before I forget, uh, there's a link in the show notes to the uh, uh, a discussion that we had with Lieutenant General Glavy, who's the Deputy Commandant for Information for the Marine Corps. And uh, he discusses that Marine Corps pub that both Eric and Ron mentioned, uh, MCDP-8. So you can go check that out. And uh, just following up on something that you just mentioned, Ron, so all of this is important, clearly. I mean, there's there's multiple you know, major foot stompers here, but something I just heard from you, which seems like it could be a major mental shift in communicating to the joint force, it's taking the perspective of the audience, right? Or, 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 or maybe starting with the audience in mind for an influence campaign. And, and it sounded like you were describing that as uh, something that 
a lot of people might not be putting first or, or, or historically that might not have been getting put first. Would you say that any of that is accurate? One of the major themes for for me, at least, you know, in, in doing these discussions is, you know, well, some of the big challenges that it seems that that we face in the West in general are, are, are things like this, like a major mindset shift on on how to think about engaging uh, in the world. And, and that includes what the what I just just brought up, but also like a mindset shift from like kinetic Thinking, right. like bombs and bullets <laughs> and killing the enemy to influencing the, the, the opponent instead. No, and I, I guess that's that's actually capturing it very well is often uh, those plans were, you know, often it's approached from a kinetic effect. Um, and then, you know, the information practitioners were approached with, okay, so now what can you do to support this? But the question is, is, did those effects, did those kinetic activities actually change the behavior that you were getting after? Were they being viewed in the context that you wanted them to be viewed so that you could drive that behavior change? And I think what we were getting at with the concept is, is we have to put that behavior change in the forefront. You know, something that came up in the podcast with General Glavy, uh, part, part of the intention is for this to be debated and to be discussed and to be kicked around at the water cooler, which, which is the way the Marine Corps doctrine is. It's like, you know, this is, this is conceptual. It's to be debated. You know, people, it's okay if people disagree, that's what we want. But this is, this is joint doctrine, right? This is not like a debate <laughs> or, or is it, you know, do, do, do you kind of get what I'm asking? To your point, like, you know, we were talking about earlier is, you know, as Eric brought out that the joint doctrine, we've got, this is one of the few times that joint doctrine has gotten ahead of service doctrine. And so that water cooler is at the service level. You know, we've put, you know, joint, you know, the, from the Jerakum to the joint pub, it's out there. And now the services um, are are working through their service doctrines and organizations. I think you're getting to it. It's they have to figure out at the, at the service level, they have to figure out what, what do we need to build? What capability, what organization systems do we need to create to provide to the joint force commander? The joint force commanders, the joint force needs to decide what do we have to ask for? JPP-04 tries to answer that question and give them, or at least give them guidance on what to ask for. And we are very, very uh, aware that this is a first lick. Um, it, it, the ideas in here need to be fully validated because frankly, they weren't because of this being a joint doctrine ahead of service doctrine. Right. And I will, I will tell you that at the combatant command level, there's, this is, so that water cooler is through the different staff processes. The services were moving out with doctrine. The combatant commands and the services were aware that JP1 back in, what was that, 2017? 2017. 2017. He signed that joint function into existence in 2017, July 7th or something. Um, that was a bit of a challenge because that joint function with no doctrine supporting it was put into JP1. So the services and the, the command commands were told to move out. Well, they did. They started coming up with their idea of what exactly does this mean? We described it further by putting it into JP30, uh, which is above 304 in the hierarchy because 304 didn't exist. And so we described it and we had our, again, I'm using the term first lick at putting it into JP30, the older version. So it was just kind of shoehorned in there. And only after that did we create a publication that said, this is what we mean in detail. That gives the services and the combatant commands more information on, okay, this is what you need to ask for. This is what you need to provide. These are the capabilities we're trying to create, the ability we're trying to have the combatant command do. The challenge though was all of that came much later than the original joint function. 
So the services had already made up their minds on, okay, how do we see this and how are we going to exploit this? And I do mean exploit in, in a couple of different ways, exploit as in, you know, really serve the needs of the command commander, but also serve the needs of the service and how we want to build certain things that might be in our interest. And every, every service has their own, um, their own desires, if you will. And I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to be sound condemning or anything like that. It's, it's, it's in their own interest to do certain things certain ways. So they were moving out before this existed. So I, I'd like to, if I could, I'd like to add to that a little bit um, because, and, and I'll, I'll go back to, to the concept discussion is, you know, earlier, earlier on, it was mentioned that information was always an afterthought. And, and through the development of the concept, you know, one of the things that we came to the realization of is, unfortunately, right, wrong, or indifferent, JP313 was read, bought, read, mostly um, read by the information community. And we realized that for information to really be brought forward into operational art um, in order to design those operations that leverage those inherent information activities is that we had to build out information in the primary publications. It had to be fleshed out in JP1. It had to be expanded on in JP3 and JP5 because those are the publications that the joint force reads writ large and not just the information community. And by it being fleshed out in those publications, when we built out JP 304, the joint forces was already starting to think about it a little bit more. And then they were looking to the information practitioners on how to get in a more finesse detail, uh, leverage information and information activities in support of joint operations. And John, if I could add um, to Ron's point about those capstone publications. And so that has been done. So we were able to, to do that while we were writing our, this, the doctrine of J joint publication 3-04. We also were reviewing and providing input to JP3-0 joint operations, which is on this, which was published recently and is on the street, as well as JP50 um, planning which is also um, recently published. Uh, so, so we've been able to do that as well as get into joint pub 2-0, which is um, intelligent, joint intelligence. Yeah, wow. Well, you guys are really giving us a, a fantastic behind the scenes uh, as to you know how all of this uh, evolves and what the many considerations are that had to be taken into account as all of this was uh, uh, was being developed. Uh, oh, and by the way, the strategic landscape is evolving the whole time while while all of this is happening. So, uh, not not an easy task at all. You guys mentioned a couple of different times uh, a body called the J. Rockham, which is the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, and they occasionally put out uh, guidance, which is important. Um, could you guys unpack this uh, uh, J. Rockham memo 068-19? Sure, John, this is uh, Eric Wallace again. Um, so the J. Rockham was um, an event that stemmed from the 17 concept required capabilities of the joint concept for operating in the information environment. That was our base to begin the study. Um, we were, uh, we the JIVIC led that for the, the uh, principal staff advisor for IO and the joint staff J39. And, and from that, we went through the process similar to how we went through the joint concept process uh, through a typical capability-based assessment for, to look at the requirements, required capabilities, and then, and then vetting those capabilities um, and prioritizing them. And that came in through the final staffing of about 51, 52 recommendations those dot mil PFP doctrine, organization, training, material, leadership and education, personnel, facilities, and policy were then all identified to institutionalize and operationalize information in joint operations. And so writing the new joint pub 
was part of that Jurakam action. But also it went into writing tactics, techniques, and procedures, looking at um, really looking at technologies and how are we going to develop science and technology to support uh, operations in the information environment. We also um, were looking at organizations. One, how does OSD organize itself uh, to look at information? And, and I think we've seen through congressional actions of the FY fiscal year 20 National Defense Authorization Act, um, section 1631, there's a host of actions that are that are currently on the docket to be looked at dealing with um, how the joint, how OSD is organized, how, how the department, the joint, the services may be organized about getting after information, looking at lexicon, that was another one that was, was, was part of that. And so those actions are, have been tasked out to services, to, to command commands, to the joint staff, and to OSD to, to execute. And so um, that is ongoing work um, that's happening in the department. The organization piece is really to look at how does the department need to relook at how it organizes itself to get after the information fight. Derek had mentioned the idea that we provided examples or ways within joint publication 3-4 that a commander might be able to consider that as part of how they get after the information fight, how they might organize themselves in order to implement the information joint function to be able to understand the impact of information on, on the operational environment, how to support human and automated decision-making, and then how to leverage information through the ability to inform audiences to influence and then to attack information, information and information systems as well as protecting uh, that same as well as the morale and will of, of the, the joint force. So, so that's where that's at. So there's a whole host of actions that are ongoing that the JIWIC Joint Information Operations Warfare Center and the Joint SFGS 39 are responsible for um, leading the implementation. That JIROC was was developed at the end of of a capabilities-based assessment. Um, and through that assessment, what, what was really key to that was the concept was exactly, you know, as it says, it's a concept. It's an operation, aspirational thought of where do we want to be in the joint force in the next, I think it was uh, 15 to 20 years. And at the end of that, you said, hey, to do that, we have to have, we have these 17 uh, concept required capabilities that'll move us there. What this what the CBA did said was here's the concept now how do we get there, and it it, it was excruciating it was painful, um, but we brought in a pretty large community um, over three or four different sessions to really break down each one of those dot mill PFP um, requirements that were laid out. You know, so for example, when we were looking at doctrine. It wasn't just looking at, you know, what is the new JP 313 now 304 look like? It was to make that stick, we have to understand there has to be a more broader discussion in JP 1. And then that has to be supported by a broader discussion in JP 3 and in JP 5. And oh, by the way, JP 2 has a role in this because of their role and responsibility for helping characterize the information environment. So, and that's just a small example, but we were allowed to take a holistic view of each one of those, those categories to really flesh out what in, what, what's required in detail. At the end of it, we sort of stepped back because we had 61 capabilities, which is quite a few. And you know, over a five year period, that's quite a task to get to but it was really capturing what we thought at that time and that body of people was this is where we need to start, at least to start moving the joint force in the direction that we had laid out in the concept and that is later captured in 304. Um, and I think if you go back and look at the Jiraka and you look at a lot of the things that have gone across 
uh, the department today, um, we're moving in a pretty good direction. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can stop and, and congratulate ourselves. We've got to carry the draw come through and then continue to build this as an area um, within the department itself. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion, gentlemen. We really appreciate your time and all of the efforts that that you three collectively put into, you know, where we are now as far as joint doctrine. Uh, so uh, typical wrap up questions. We have quite a few students and researchers who listen to this podcast. Could one of you offer a fruitful research question that may be related to the kinds of things that we've been talking about here? It John, I'll, I'll take that one on. I, I unfortunately don't have a specific uh, research question for you, but I've got a, a couple of references. One is there was a operations in the information environment science and technology report that was that was published. I think it was in 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 2020 that uh, is still out there. That it really has um, eight to nine areas of, of research that's that's required to 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 really um, enable operations in the information environment. And then the, the second thing is there's some work going on at the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering uh, to, to look at a strategy for operations in the information environment. And so that particular document should be out for, I think it's out for coordination now, but should be published in probably the next three to four months. So, so I'll leave that with you. Excellent, excellent. Well, we will uh, provide a link to those resources when they're available. And uh, finally, uh, could one of you recommend a, a good book that IO practitioners or those interested in these kinds of topics might check out in order to get a deeper dive? This is Ron. So I'm not going to go, go the direct route. I, I would offer that um, just like with any other uh, um, military branch or specialty, if you will, uh, I would say the information professionals within DOD is to go back to some of the core documents and we can provide you a list of those. Um, going back to the work of Dr. Thomas Rona, uh, who coined the term information warfare and what he was looking at. Um, he's the one who introduced the idea of information warfare uh, more from a technical sense but towards the end, it was, I think it was in the end of that publication, he also spoke to the larger application of information and what it could mean uh, to the military. Um, there's a lot of work that uh, Dr. John Arquilla has done uh, through his efforts with RAND. Um, and I can provide you uh, a link with uh, some of those. Instead of looking forward, I would look backwards and understand where the foundations of information operations came from. I guess what I'm really trying to get at is um, I would, I would, if I were speaking to young information professionals, it would be to study your art, uh, just as um, infantry guys study the art of infantry tactics and, and take it all the way back to its foundations and the Navy understands naval warfare, Air Force, et cetera. Um, and we do have some foundational documents, but um, I think they're lost on a large part of the community and, and we can provide a list of those. Well, uh, gentlemen, you have given us a lot to think about, obviously. And uh, with that, Eric Wallace, Derek Elliott and Ron Walters, thank you all so much for having been guests on The Cognitive Crucible. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.